Hello, everyone. Welcome. I think, are we the last session, or is there more after me? No, there's a couple more after There's a couple more. Okay, good, good. That makes me feel a lot better. I don't want to be the, the one responsible for closing on the, the high note. Um, so yeah, I'm an SRE at Google in Sydney, and I want to give you uh, a talk about part of my life in which uh, I experienced ops overload in my team and how the team worked to overcome that. Um, so yeah, a few years ago, the team I was on was suffering from too much work and not enough time to do it in. And uh, around that time, uh, a woman named Alice Goldfuss was doing a thing on Twitter called the on-call selfie and you know, you could post yourself as you were on call and kind of, she was uh, judging people's reactions to the, uh, the effects of being on call. So, um, you know, whenever you've got a page, take a selfie, stick it on Twitter. Um, so she gave a talk about this at Monitorama last year, 2017, and I featured in that talk as an example of somebody who was on call on New Year's Eve, having a great time with my family, uh, getting really excited about the upcoming leap second. <laughs> but really, what's happening in this picture is uh, I am in the process of burning out. And I didn't know it at the time. Uh, so uh, that, that might be a surprise because, you know, Google wrote a book about best practices and yet we still have um, varying levels of maturity within the company. Uh, and I like to think of it in terms of the William Gibson quote that the future is here, but it's just not very evenly distributed yet. Um, on this team, our pager load was so high that we were ranked the 100th percentile worst on-call shift of any team at Google. And we got that rating twice successively over two six-month review periods. And obviously that's not really something to celebrate. So we were given very explicit instructions that what we should do is nothing other than work to reduce our pager load. So I want to talk to you about something that we did to uh, refocus our energy on the problems that matter, which gave us some more time to fix those problems. And then we can start to adjust the expectations of the system back to the levels we were supporting at, but without burning our own energy and uh, um, like our, uh, our health to do so. Um, so I'd, I'd known about this technique for a long time, but I didn't really understand it before then. Um, but other teams at Google have been using it for quite a long time and, and had sworn by it. So you know, there's a lot of uh, knowledge within the company about how to get this done. So that was quite useful to us. Um, so as we go through this journey, I, I want to take us through some of these um, milestones to, to get there. So if you've read the SRE book, then you'll know that paging on a cause is a great recipe for alert fatigue because you have problems, and some of them are actually quite valid problems, but in aggregate, these problems become too many to manage. Now, I, I understand that these alerts are quite compelling because they tell you exactly what's wrong. They're a constant diagnostic check on what's broken in the system, and they're running all the time, and it's great, so you're like, there's little indicator lights popping up all the time saying this thing is broken, that thing's broken, and you know, uh, a user might call up and say, hey, the website's really slow, I can't do the thing I need to do, and you go, great, I know exactly that's because the, um, this disk in the RAID array has failed, and you know, uh, it's degraded, so that's why reads are slow, and that's, you know, I know that's why the website is slow. But uh, in my team, we had tens of thousands of disks and although we don't page directly on the disks failing themselves, we were, uh, that's too far down on the stack for us. We were paging on things like read and write availability of pieces of the database. Um, so it, you know, parts of the database weren't there at the time. Uh, so that caused replication to fall behind. Well, that might mean that users start to feel the uh, actual effects of eventual consistency in all its glory. But are these symptoms of a system or are they the causes of problems in the system? And I suppose it really depends on where you are in the stack. So what is a symptom-based alert? Uh, well, you know a symptom is knowing that something is wrong, but not necessarily knowing why that feeling is there. Um, it's having a bad experience. It's like going to the doctor and saying, you know, I've got pain in my lower back, or uh, I have a sore throat, but it's not going to the doctor and saying, oh, I know that I have pain in my back because like, I don't bend my knees when I lift my children, or you know, there's a cold going around daycare again, and that's why I have a sore throat. Like, you just tell the doctor what you feel, and the doctor tries to figure that out instead. And so likewise, I prefer to know that the, there are too many errors, or the latency is too high, or users are unhappy, rather than there is a particular disk that is broken right now, or there is packet loss going on the network, 
because I expect packets that are being lost all the time, and I also expect that the disks are crashing all the time, but then my team has like tens of thousands of disks, so you know, that's maybe just be me. Uh, so I've got this idea of um, monitoring sucks, uh, a whole bunch of stuff in operations does suck, and I believe I know why, and that's because as systems grow, the cost of maintenance also goes up. So if you want to keep operational load down in a system, well, you've got events that are causing work to be done, and if that event is occurring more often as the system gets bigger, then you know, the time that you spend working on that type of problem is going to increase as well. So you might see that the percentage of an event occurring in the system stays about constant with the size of the system. The absolute volume of that thing is increasing over time, but you know, we don't actually get uh, extra days in the week to, uh, to work on this stuff as the system gets bigger, so we just have to make sure that that total amount of work stays within the capacity of the team. And so in SRE at Google, we have this idea that ops work is like, has to be less than 50% of the total capacity of the team so that we can also do the work to make that type of work not show up anymore. Now in my team at the time, we were definitely abo above the red line uh, in terms of how much work we were having to do. Now thanks to good practices like continuous delivery, the rate of change in our online systems is really high, high enough that investing in the specialized diagnostics ends up being a bad return on investment. So these specializations are either uh, quickly becoming obsolete because they are talking about parts of the system that don't exist anymore, or they become technical debt because they're creating a bunch of inertia or friction around making changes to that part of the system. So a bad diagnostic alert, I believe, is like a bad test, a bad unit test or integration test, because, or, or a poorly, poorly de designed API or some unnecessary tight coupling between these independent parts. Is it there because it's part of the functional spec of the system, or is it just testing some implementation detail? And so if you change the system, do you also need to change the test? Do you remember that the test is there because of a particular implementation detail, or is it testing some like uh, higher level functionality that should remain after the change occurs? Now, removing these things also takes time. So as your system is getting bigger, you have to remember to allocate time to make the changes to the alerts that no longer are necessary. Uh, and this ends up being something that's also kind of shrouded in fear and superstition because people forget why it was there or they remember the last time there was an outage that they either created the alert for or that alert saved them. Um, and so there's lots of discussion and people, don't get, uh, that people get very emotionally invested in whether or not an alert should exist. Um, or we could just not be building them in the first place and that saves a whole lot of time in advance. Uh, so I want to suggest to you that by investing less in automatic diagnostics of specific causes and reporting all of them and instead focus our energy on alerting on a very small set of expectations about the system that actually matter to you, the functionality of the service and to the users of that service, that there's uh, like a constant size, a number of things that you should be testing for and that's not dependent on the number of components in the system. So we're not fanning out by the number of disks or processors or even the number of data centers that we have. So I'm going to talk a bit later about how to transform the tools to support this generalization. But the teaser is basically we're improving the observability of a system. So for example, GDB, the GNU debugger, is an excellent tool for asking questions of a single process. And maybe we want something like GDB for distributed systems. But the question remaining now is, how do we know what a symptom-based alert is? Was this key range is unavailable a symptom? Well, it is, but it's not to my user. We can tell if an alert is a symptom because it's, uh, sorry, if it's symptom-based or cause-based because we look at what the service is supposed to be doing. If the users are having a bad time, we can say that's a symptom. Anything inside the service or in the dependencies below the service are not symptoms. The users don't care that the reason part of the key space is unavailable is because RPC queue depth is too deep. And if the users are not having a bad time right now, then neither do we. So how do we get the user's perspective to find out if they're having a bad experience? I mean, without having them to call us up all the time and say so, because isn't that the whole point of a monitoring system in the first place? 
But before we answer that, I want to take a little detour. We know that parts are failing, and this is happening all the time. We've already identified that we don't want to page on all of these things failing, and only the things that matter. And we want there to be not very many of these things, these rules about what matters. So what I'm trying to get to is how do we know how much failure is acceptable? We know what a service level is in other contexts with names like tolerance. There is some amount of variance that is acceptable up to a point. And that amount we call the error budget. The smaller the budget, the tighter the tolerance. So we have a budget. We're not trying to spend it like it's coming up to tax time and we've got specials on errors half price. But we do expect that it gets used and we want to keep a track of how it's spent, just like a real budget. We want to spend that money. We want to spend those errors. We want to know how fast we're spending it so that we don't exceed what we've allocated in that budget. We know the budget also gets used without our permission. There are bugs in our own and other systems. We have users who trigger events of all, all kinds. We have natural disasters and, of course, ourselves. Now, one great thing about being on call over New Year's and the holiday period is that nothing ever breaks. So, you know, totally great time to be on call um, because nobody's mutating the system, nobody's making changes. So, like, actually nothing is going to break anymore. So, assuming we have not yet lost all those queries to these things, we still have some left over that we can play with and we can use that remainder to do things like testing and production by uh, performing experiments and seeing how fast we've broken things or have we made improvements to the rate of change of, of um, the uh, uh, budget usage. So I want us to recognize that if we don't set any expectations about how we use the budget and we don't use it to our advantage, it becomes lost. So the tool we use to set our expectations is the SLO, which is an abstraction against a service. You don't need to know the intimate details of the composition of the service, but you have an expectation that performance will meet this criteria. And a user of the service now can build around that SLO. And if the SLO is worse than what they need, they can engineer systems on top of that to get what they need. So people are building against this service level. But when you offer a service, a user of that service expects that it applies to them and them alone. You can't provide a meaningful aggregate SLA across all of the users because the small users get lost in the noise of the big ones. But you don't, I don't think you should try, uh, treat small users as uh, not mattering just because they aren't using the system as much. They are expecting that that SLA you've given them is equally as applicable to them. So everyone should be measured as if they're the only user. And as a side effect, this is a forcing function for developing better isolation within the system. Now, if you didn't get a chance to see uh, Francis McDonald's talk yesterday, I encourage you to watch the video. So we have parallels with other engineering disciplines because picking a tolerance depends on many factors. So how do we pick our tolerances? How do we pick our own SLOs? We can measure our current performance. We can look at our operational load and decide whether or not that's an acceptable amount of work we're doing. And then we can also negotiate with our users or talk to them and understand what it is they're trying to achieve with the system. Uh, Ketan Ganga-Kirta spoke on Wednesday about building SLOs based on user empathy, which was an excellent talk, and I highly recommend you watch that video as well. Uh, but when we're in doubt, the SLO is the status quo. It's what's already happening, and uh, users have already built an expectation about it. So if your service doesn't have an SLO, you're wrong. It does. And if your service is currently better than what you think, then people are going to come to expect that better performance than what you're advertising. And that's going to turn into more superstition, where now your team can't really uh, make any changes because nobody's really sure about what the SLO means because the one that you said doesn't apply anymore and so everyone becomes very risk averse and there's lots of general confusion about what you can do anymore. So you have to maintain the SLO, you have to spend the budget that you've allocated or set the SLO to be what is actually happening. Now with an SLO we can easily define what 
the symptoms are, because we know what the system is supposed to do. And we can say things like, a symptom is any time the SLO is at risk. So how do we make a symptom-based alert? We just program the SLO. Now we know that availability is the uptime over the total time. And we can say things like, an availability target of uh, four nines can, means we can be down for 52 and a bit minutes every year, and we still stay within our targets. But how do we measure the uptime of a distributed system? If a microservice crashes in the cloud and no queries are in flight, does it make a sound? Computers, and especially queries that they're serving, are much easier to model as discrete time series, discrete maths. So we can convert our availability function into one in which you just count things that we receive and count the times that we uh, return, uh, respond to that, and that's how we can measure the uptime. So if we're doing uh, one million requests in a day with a daily availability target of four nines, we can serve up to 100 errors and we still hit our target. How do we measure this? Well, it's quite simple. You put uh, some instrumentation in your app, and then every time you do a thing, you increment a counter. We can count the response codes every time we receive a request and we return a, uh, a response to a user, and we can break it down by however we want to partition it. We can say there's a particular error code that was on this request, a particular user made the request. And you can add as much dimensionality as you feel comfortable with. I'm obviously making simplifying assumptions here. We can't do this outside of the application through synthetic monitoring, because even though synthetic monitoring is useful for knowing whether the system is behaving uh, as an end-to-end -end test, as a user, uh, synthetic user-like request, we can say the system is performing an action. We can't make any assumptions about uh, what the availability, availability of the system is at that point, because in the most generous case, at best we can interpolate between two samples and guess what's happening in, in the middle there. Now it gets worse as the query rate goes up, but the sampling rate stays about constant because obviously then you're getting the reciprocal of the, uh, the query rate. So even better than measuring within the application itself, maybe you can push the your measurement to the load balancer. Uh, and that way, if any part of the application has crashed, the measurements within that application aren't completely lost because we can observe that there's now missing data by counting the incoming requests at the load balancer and summing up the responses coming out of the application, compare them, they should be the same number. The sum of the numbers coming in, the sum of the numbers coming out should be the same number. And if they're different, then we can make assumptions that, that we've uh, missed availability targets, perhaps. Sorry, spent some of that error, error budget. So what we want to do then is just start with the favorite uh, time series monitoring system, collect and compute our availability by programming it against, uh, so we compute the SLI, the service level indicator, to say this is the measurement that we are uh, interested in. And then we measure that value over a time period and that's the SLO duration, so 30 days, 60 days a year, whatever you like. And then we report to say whether or not that has gone over the threshold that we set. And that's it, really. That's uh, SLO-based alerting. But this is quite noisy because we're generating instantaneous rates. And the instantaneous rate of a service is, going, is fluctuating quite a lot in response to user traffic spikes or perhaps temporary errors and glitches and so forth. Uh, and if we've set an SLO of um, a 30-day window, then it doesn't make, make any sense to page on an instantaneous burst that has gone over the uh, point in time uh, error rate that is acceptable. So you can still get qu uh, paged quite frequently with this setup, and obviously that's not what we're trying to achieve. So instead, let's figure out what the rate of consumption of the budget is, and then if we think that we're going to consume the budget faster than we want, like all or some large percentage of our budget in a short time period, then that's something we want to learn on. So we're going to try and predict the future and then uh, make estimates about what we should do. So the rate of consumption we call 
Uh, an error, uh, so the rate of consumption of the error budget, we inside Google call the SLO burn rate. And so we alert if the burn rate means that we're going to exhaust our error budget sooner than we want. In shorter time scales, say if we have a 30-day SLO, but we want to react within a day, then we can scale the number of errors we expect to burn in a day and then say, okay, that's how many we're allowed to serve in that window of time. And then we want to set the alert to say there's a gradient of, of uh, error rate consumption that is okay and anything above that gradient is not okay and we just kind of pick a gradient that makes sense to us at the time. And because these are estimates, we can be uh, pretty loose with the mathematics. I know that like doing a linear extrapolation like this is, is not very accurate, but we're talking on the time scale of days and weeks to, um, to react to this stuff. So like, we can be a bit rough and have a pretty good signal out of that. So if you have an error budget of 1%, like a 2.9 service, and that's doing 1,000 queries per second, we have 10 queries per second to burn. Over a longer period, like a week or a month or a quarter, the total number of events and tolerance for errors is much larger. So if we say that our SLO is one week long, then we have 1,000 by 86400 by seven total queries, which is that number. Uh, on average, and we have 1% of them on, uh, available to, to, to use up at any point within that time window. So if we're using up errors faster than 10 per second on average over the course of that long period of time, then we should say, uh, fire an alert. And so we could say things like maybe if that rate of consumption is over the next 24 hours, like that seems like a good value to say it's time to uh, throw up an alert to uh, on call and say, we, we're going to exhaust our budget within the next 24 hours, and that's uh, obviously something that's quite dangerous, so a human now, uh, now should uh, be involved. But a week is a long time to compute rates of consumption over, and it requires a lot more memory to store all the time series, so maybe that's not what we want to do. So we can say, uh, take a small time window that fits in memory, it's very fast to compute, we can get a quick reaction to it, um, so maybe we compute it over 15 minutes, extrapolate over the next day, and so that smooths out the burstiness. It gives us um, a little bit of prediction into the future and a faster response time than were we to say, wait for uh, a whole day before you saw an uptick in, um, in the rate of consumption before paging anyone. And like I said, this is all estimates. We're just trying to predict the future. We're making stuff up, but you know, with a little bit of science behind it. And so, you know, if the, the actual gradient is zero any errors per second over an alerting window of one hour, I know I keep changing the uh, dimensions I'm using, but, you know, this is all just uh, examples. So if the 15-minute rate of consumption is over 70 per second, then we fire an alert in this totally made-up example. Now, if you've used Prometheus, the, um, well, this is Prometheus pseudocode-ish. Uh, so you can see that like, it's totally possible to program it. It's really simple mathematics. And we have quite a bit of time, so I'm going to try and show you a demo. And it's totally going to work this time. Oop, that's good. OK, so. Um, I have a Prometheus server running. I have um, some uh, small Go programs running that are pretending to be a little load balance cl cluster. And I have uh, Apache Bench running against that cluster. Font size. Oh, yep, font size, got it. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, so one these. More. One more, okay. Is everyone in the back can uh, read that okay? Give me a wave, some thumbs up, excellent. I don't think I saw any thumbs downs. Cool. Uh, so I have a hard coded error budget of um, 10%. I'm making this example deliberately uh, coarse so that it, it works. Uh, I want an SLO period of um, 30 minutes. So I want to say, like, I have a 10% error budget over every 30-minute window. 
it's a, it's a pretty good service. Uh, the burn period is 600, which means over the next um, 600 seconds, that's how, like, if, if I burn the entire error budget faster than that, that's when I want to get paged. And then the uh, other bits are just, like, factoring part of the expression. The really interesting part here is the, uh, I've, I've computed the expected number of events we should be getting over the total time window, the SLO period, and uh, I've set the alerting threshold is basically the error budget fraction of that total number, and then the burn rate is the, um, the, the rate of increase of the current errors. And so we're basically comparing current performance against predicted performance, and then we throw an alert if we don't meet our expectations. Okay, so if I flick over here, you should see. All right, so this is, this is my current burn rate. It's about 20 per second. And we go down, I can show you the alerting threshold, which is, that's weird. <laughs> How good are demos? There we go. So we've got a budget of 30 per second in this example, and we're currently spending 20 per second. Uh, I should say the um, Go program is, uh, it fails randomly at 1% of the time. Um, so it's, you know, simulating a bunch of failure. Just bring this one up here and say, uh, so I've got a little load balancer, and it round robins to all the back ends that are called S, and there's 10 of them. 1% of the queries are failing with a 500 error, the rest are returning a 200 OK. What else we got here? Um, yep, so I'll just refresh that one because the uh, burn rate exceeded alert is definitely not firing at the moment. And our last tab is showing us the current burn rate. So there we go. Sorry, the cumulative errors. And the reason why this is currently a value is because um, I was running it a while ago. So we can see that. Um, I'm just going to shrink that one a little so it fits on the screen. So that's, a, that's stepping up over every time the number of errors increases. It's just counting the number of errors over time. Um, you should be able to zoom out and see, whoops, you should be able to zoom out and see that, ah. How good are demos? OK, so we can see there's a gradient of error burn right now. And it's a bit choppy because we're doing it on a, sh a, a short time scale. So what I'm going to do now is replace one of the servers with one that fails 10% of the time. And then if I reload the error burn, the, sorry, the error consumption graph here, we can see that there's a bit of a step as the process restarted and we lost some queries. And if you squint, you'll notice that the gradient at the very end is a little bit uh, steeper. But if we go back to our alert threshold. The alerting threshold is still the same because the number of queries we're sending is still the same, so our expected burn rate is still, um, sorry, our total number of events coming th through is about the same because the, uh, the incoming load is still the same. But let's have a look at our burn rate. That should have moved up a little bit. So if we go back to our uh, alert here, reload this page, we'll see that the burn rate is still not exceeded. So now I'm just going to kill that task, and that will cause ten, um, whole ten percent of queries to never respond, and the sort of load balance will end up failing. And if we ex uh, reload this um, graph now, you can see that the uh, gradient has increased rapidly. So I expect that we'll see um, our burn rate has suddenly spiked up. And the uh, alert threshold should still be about the same. I think what we're seeing in this rigging here is just a, a side effect of the programs I've written of not very good. And if we go back to our alert, oh yeah, 
just so you know, um, Prometheus has noticed that that task is broken now. And we should see that our burn rate has totally been exceeded right now. So yes, we've been paged for consumption of the error budget, and I'm very excited that the demo has done what I expected to do. Here. Okay, so if we're only page when we're at risk of breaking the SLO, how do we know what's wrong with the system? And without any uh, cause based alerts, uh, like it's going to take us a little while to figure out what's going on. We don't immediately know what the proximate causes of failure within the system are because we've just told the system not to um, do these diagnostics anymore. So let's have a talk about observability. And to me, observability is just an inherent property of a system, and you make it uh, improve by adding things, adding instrumentation, and it's worse by you'll not, be a, you're not able to ask questions about a system. Now, if you're in the 2000s and you have a single processor application, and you know, uh, cloud is just a, uh, a gleam in somebody's eye, chances are you're attaching a, a debugger to a process or, or looking at a core dump, and you're trying to figure out what's going on in the process. With GDB, all of these applications are highly observable. And if you're thinking about distri uh, modern distributed systems parlance, the GDB is, the, the debugger is a observability sidecar that sits next to your process and lets you look inside it. But across address spaces, we need a way of tracking all of these call stacks and setting breakpoints and you know, inspecting values inside the program. And without this sidecar, what do you do? Well, you have to put it inside the application explicitly. And that's why you know, we start out with these poorly observable systems. And gradually, over time, as we add this instrumentation to it, then the uh, level of, of observability increases. And we have a couple of ways, two or three ways, depending on how you do this, uh, sorry, depending on how you count. We have logs or event logs. We have traces. And they might just be a specialized form of event log. And we have metrics. And maybe they're just events. And then we have exceptions and stack traces and core dumps. And like, that's a whole different kind of thing. So we're not, like, I don't really know how to classify them. So. Uh, these three or just one thing raise the observability of a system and so that you can debug it. And that's the whole point of observability, in my mind, is that so you can debug it, you can understand what is going on in the system. And there's too much stuff going on in real time, so it, we need to record all this stuff and capture these things for, for later investigation. And that's what um, these time series databases are for. That's what these uh, tracing databases are for. That's what log aggregators are for. So we can go and do some forensics after the fact. We, we know that there's been a problem. We go and gather all the evidence. We investigate it. So I want to be clear that I don't believe that monitoring and alerting are substitutes for debugging. Monitoring is a way of automating the part of watching a system to make sure that it's still doing what it's supposed to be doing. Because I don't like sitting in front of dashboards looking at charts every day. I want the robots to do that for me. But then once we do know that there's a problem and that we know that it's a problem that matters to us, we still have to debug it. And that we can do with our uh, awesome pattern matching inference engine inside our heads. And we can use that to process the information very quickly. So uh, what, what replaces our cause-based alerts? It's our debugging tools because there are always going to be unknown situations in the system that we haven't yet programmed a diagnostic for. And so we need a way to answer those, uh, follow those clues and answer questions of the system and get those answers so we can understand what's gone wrong. And we have to do that anyway. So if we spend time making uh, diagnostic alerts for the things we do know already about, but then we still have to go and do that work anyway, we haven't saved ourselves any time because we're still going to have to use the debugging tools for the new situations. And every time you make a new diagnostic for low-level causes, 
we are creating more inertia in the system. And if they really do protect expectations of the system, then they should absolutely be there. But if they don't need to be there, if they're not protecting uh, functional aspects of the system that you want to uh, keep, then I say prefer to skill up on using your brain and using uh, debugging t uh, tools. Now I've got a caveat, because there's always one, and that's uh, diagnostic alerts are good when they're reusable because the cost of maintenance is low and perhaps the return on having that then becomes high. So if you have a generic alert that is saying, say, uh, back-end RPC error rates are got, uh, too high, then perhaps that's useful because you're reusing the same RPC framework across all of your systems and so you've only written one rule that's applicable everywhere and every time you add a new RPC you haven't done any extra work to get the monitoring out of that. But if you have existing cause-based alerts that are not like that, and you don't yet want to get rid of them because you're afraid, what you can do is just downgrade their severity. You can, instead of paging someone, file a ticket, or instead of filing a ticket, downgrade them to not go anywhere, but show up on a dashboard, like it's an indicator light. Uh, it's not going to bother anyone unless they explicitly go looking for it, and perhaps they're looking for it because they've been paged for something else, and that indicator might help them. And if that indicator doesn't help them, then you know you should get rid of it. And that helps you build some information about whether it like, uh, remove the fog of fear around this alert. You can start saying, well, have people actually used that to gain any information about the system? And in my experience, every time I've tried to do this, thinking it's a brilliant idea, people never ever look at them. And they always just go and debug it by themselves and figure out the answer. And the indicator lights were a waste of time. So, I don't go on call for the sake of being on call, and I think a lot of people feel that way too. People don't like being on call, generally. Sometimes it's stressful. There's a lot of unknown things happening in the system. Uh, but we can improve this. And I, I go on call not because that's a thing that SREs have to do or system administrators have to do. I do it because being on call is a tool for improving the product. There's only so much the monitoring system can do, and at some point, it requires humans to do things too. So we work in like a symbiotic relationship. But that means that the things that page me have to be the things that I care about, and I absolutely require that that be as few things as possible, and that's where the SLO comes in. Now, alerts never go away by themselves, because once they're created, they sit there, and they only ever increase in number if they, left, if they are left unchecked. They only go away by working at them. So periodic review of what happened every week. We can look for trends. We can uh, look for things that didn't affect anybody or nobody did anything about them. Or there's a repetitive mitigation applied every time this thing happens. And then we can start to do things about that, such as delete them or build some new automation that takes care of the problem for us. So you set a goal for the number of pages that your team should be re re receiving over a period of time, and that's a kind of an SLO in itself. Uh, and you work towards that goal. And then once you achieve that goal, then everything is good. And so inside Google, we talk about this idea of operational excellence. And to me, that is something you can make a career out of. So I don't think that making software is a goal or running software systems is a goal, but being able to live my life and make the things around me better, that to me is what I think uh, the goal is. So uh, through this talk we had a, a recap of SLOs and error budgets and hopefully a convincing argument why they're better than any other way of building alerts. Uh, personally I think this is quite important because my life was bad for a while and then it got better. Um, also PagerDuty put out a report at the end of last year that basically said most people who are on call are having a bad time. They're getting woken up in the middle of the night, and they're getting paged way too much. We did a quick walkthrough of the mathematics involved in programming a SLO-based alert, and I had a little uh, rant about what I think tools should look like and um, how the experience of debugging while on call should be. Uh, but let me summarize by saying uh, the team I was on, we took the worst rotation in all of Google for two uh, reviews running 
into a service that consistently met the expectations of less than two pages per shift for four weeks running, at which point we had a little celebration, and then kept it below that forever. And so I hope you can agree that uh, making a symptom-based alert is actually quite an easy thing to do, and then it's useful for any organization, no matter what the size. And perhaps you're thinking, I don't know if like, my, the service is big enough yet to think about this, and maybe my cause-based alerts are, are totally fine, and I'm going to say that's okay, but now maybe at some point you'll hit a breaking point and you know what to do about it. So thank you very much for listening to me, and I hope you uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>